Hello students, I am R. Svarnalita, Assistant Professor from the Department of Management Sciences at PhD College of Arts and Science, Coimbatore. I welcome you to the session on strategy formulation. We will be looking into the definition of strategy formulation, different schools of thought on strategy formulation and the steps involved in strategy formulation. So to begin with, what is strategy formulation? It is a planning process which requires making decisions after a thorough study of internal and external environmental factors relevant for the organization. It is the second step involved in the strategic management process. The strategic management process means defining the organization's strategy. It's also defined as the process by which managers make a choice of set of strategies for the organization that will enable it to achieve better performance. Strategic management is a continuous process that apprises the business and industries in which the organization is involved. It apprises its competitors and fixes goals to meet all the present and future competitors and then reassesses each strategy. Strategic management process has got four steps involved in it. Number one is the environmental scanning. Number two is the strategy formulation. Number three is strategy implementation and the last one is strategy evaluation. Let's see each step in detail. In this four steps, strategy formulation is the second step in the management process. Strategy formulation refers to the process of choosing the most appropriate course of action for the realization of organizational goals and objectives and thereby achieving the organizational vision. There are several schools of thought regarding strategy formation. Minsberg et al. has identified 10 schools of thought in strategy formulation which has been developed over a period of time. The number one is the design school, planning school, positioning school, entrepreneurial school, cognitive school, learning school, power school, cultural school, environmental school and configuration school. Two more schools of thoughts have also been developed later. Warren in 2002 developed dynamic strategy school of thought and Kim and Marbone developed reconstructionist school of thought in 2005. We will now deal each school of thought in detail. Number one is the design school. This school views strategy formulation as a process of conception. It was developed during late 1950s and 60s and it views that strategies are formulated in a democratic process with a view to match organizational situation with environmental situation. The chief executive of the organization guides the process of strategy formulation. The process tends to be simple and informal and it's based on judgment and thinking. It supports strong and visionary leadership. The major contributors in this school are Selznick and Anders. This school of thought is applicable to those organizations which operate in simple and stable environment. This does not apply to those organizations operating in dynamic and flexible environment. So next is the planning school of thought. This planning school of thought views strategy formation as a formal process that includes rigorous set of steps from the analysis of the situation to formulating a strategy and implementing it. It was developed in 1960s, which views strategy as a plan divided into sub-strategies and programs. The lead role in strategy formation is played by the planners. The main contribution in this planning school is from Ansoff in 1965. The school gives clear direction for the action and enables resource allocations as the planners can pre-screen the facts. This thought too does not work in the dynamic environment. The next school of thought is positioning school. This school views strategy formation as an analytical process and places a business within the context of its industry and looks at how the organization can improve its strategic propositioning within that industry. It was developed during 1970s and 80s and the positioning school puts emphasis on analyzing the nature of the industry concerned and the strategy is based on that analysis. 
The major contributors in the school are Schindel and Hattin along with Porter. This provides strategy formulation in a systematic way and focuses on economic facts. The school ignores certain key variables like power, politics and culture of the organization that shapes the strategy. After the planning school, the next school of thought on strategy formulation is entrepreneurial school. This views strategy formation as a visionary process which takes place within the mind of the leader or founder of the organization. Such a leader has some kind of charismatic qualities and the strategy is the outcome of those qualities. It was developed during 1950s and the major contributors to the school are Scumpeter and Cole. The school places emphasis on the most innate process, namely intuition, wisdom, judgment, insight and experience. We will now look into the view of cognitive school. The school views strategy formation as a mental process involving the analysis of how people perceive patterns and process in the strategy formation. It was developed during 1940s and 50s and concentrates on analysis of what is happening in the mindset of strategist and how he processes the information. The major contributors in this school are Simon and Marsh. The contribution in this school is that strategies emerge as concepts, maps, schemes and frames of reality. Thus, it points to the creative side of the <coughs> strategy formation process. The sixth school of thought is the learning school. This school of thought views strategy formation as an emergent process in which management pays close attention over what works and what does not work. This was developed during 1950s and the contributors to this school are Lindblom, Syed, Marsh, Wake, Quinn, Sinch, Prahalad and Hamel. In this school, strategies emerge in small steps as an organization adapts or learns. The school of thought views the plan as tactics as it involves small and sensible steps in formulating the plan. It offers a solution to deal with complexity and unpredictability in strategy formation. It emphasizes that anyone who learns may become a strategist. The next school of thought is the power school. The school views strategy formation as a negotiation process in which a strategy is developed as a process of negotiation between power holders within an organization or between organization and its external stakeholders. It was developed during 1970s and 80s and the major contributors to this school of thought are Allison, Pfeffer, Salanik and Asley. The school treats strategy formation as a political process based on the theories of collision and bargaining. It can help to break through obstacles to necessary change. It can help to decrease the resistance after a decision is made. It is democratic and realistic. It gives insights to understand strategic alliances, joint ventures and analyze the stakeholders. The school of thought overstates the role of power relationship as a major determinant of strategy formation which is true in very limited number of situations. It can lead to distortions and aberrations and it's quite costly. It overstates the role of power in strategy formation. The eighth school of thought is cultural school. This school views strategy formation as a corrective process in which various groups and departments of an organization involved collectively in strategy formation. It was developed during 1960s and the major contributors to this school of thought are Henman and Norman. This school states that the strategy that is developed is the reflection of the organizational members. It explains the role of social process, values and beliefs which prevail in an organization in its strategy formation. It also helps in explaining the logic behind resistance to strategic change. The school places more emphasis on mergers and acquisitions. Let's now look into the contribution from environmental school. The school views strategy formation as a reactive process in which strategy formation is a kind of response to the challenges imposed by the external environment. 
was developed during 1960s and 70s and the major contributors to the school are Hannon, Freeman and Hug Ittel. The school views environment as a major factor in strategy formation process whereas other schools have treated this as one of the factors in strategy formation. The school of thought appears to be reactive in the sense that it puts emphasis on environmental response implying that an organization's strategy depends on the kind of existing environment. The tenth school of thought is the configuration school. The school views strategy formation as a transformation process in which strategy formation aims at transforming from one state to another. It was developed during 1960s and 70s and this school states that Strategy formation takes place in a context and depending on the nature of that context, strategy formation may undertake any process identified by other schools. Strategy formation tends to be integrative, episodic and sequential, incorporating various elements. The school of thought gives due importance to some stable factors of organization which relates to all time periods. Let's now look into Warren's Dynamic Strategy School. The school opines that the ultimate concern of strategic management is to quantitatively improve the performance through time. The dynamic model of strategic process is a way of understanding how strategic actions occur. It recognizes that strategic planning is dynamic and involves a complex pattern of actions and reactions. The school of thought developed by Warren suggests that the target of strategy dynamics is to answer some challenging situations in the business scenario. According to Warren, there are three principles in strategic dynamics. Performance depends on resources. Resources are utilized and gets depleted. Flow rate depends on existing resources. When combined, these principles create an integrated strategy suitable for the organization in dynamic environment. The final school of thought on strategy formulation is by Kim and Marbone, which is a reconstructionist school of strategy formulation. The school views strategy formulation based on the world view in which market boundaries and industries can be restructured by the actions and belief of industry players. Kim and Marbone, contributors of the school, have termed various strategies that are based on competition in an industry as red ocean strategies. They feel that these strategies are based on the assumption that industry structural conditions are given and firms are forced to compete with them. The contributors of this thought have identified blue ocean strategies as the developing and innovative markets that have less or nil competition known as blue oceans. This strategy stipulates that operating in blue oceans where there is no competition leads to cost efficiency and value addition for both the company and the customers. Therefore, this thought is quite innovative and makes the strategists to think about how to maximize the customer value through differentiation and cost efficiency. The contributors of this school of thought opine that this blue ocean strategy can be applied by all organizations which support innovative culture and takes great risk in the business. For example, Ratan Tata's introduction of a stream car namely nano vehicle, the only one in the market at economic price for which there is less competition. We have now looked into the different schools of thought given by management thinkers. Hope you would have understood the contribution behind each school of thought and how they have got developed over the following years with a changing business environment. Now, let's proceed with strategy formulation process. As I've told you earlier, strategy formulation is concerned with evolving a corporate's mission, objectives, strategies and policies. It starts with situation analysis, which involves assessing the strategic fit between external opportunities and internal strengths and external threats and internal weakness. It is concerned with the following task, development of organization, vision and mission, environment scanning, 
formulation of strategic alternatives, development of strategic choice and strategy evaluation and selection of strategy. Now let's look into each step in detail. The first step is the development of organizational vision and mission. The starting point in strategy formulation is establishing the strategic intent. So what is meant by strategic intent? It includes the formulation of vision, mission and objectives. Vision occupies the top position in the hierarchy. Therefore, all strategic actions should focus on the vision to convert it into reality. The vision of the organization refers to the broad category of long-term intentions that the organization wishes to pursue. It's the image of how the organization sees itself. Good vision statements are broad, all-inclusive, forward-thinking, driving aspirations for the future and a dream that's shared across the entire organization. An ideal vision should be inspiring, motivating, challenging, realistic, credible and attractive, having future focus orientation, an actionable slogan and should be easily communicated and shared among the whole organization and its stakeholders. Vision helps in formulating strategies in the following manner. Vision provides clue about where the organization is heading for the future. It tries to place the organization in a unique position which requires unique actions. It encourages organizational workforce to contribute to the formulation of strategies. So after knowing what is a vision, now let's see what is a mission. The mission statement makes the vision statement more tangible and comprehensible. It is at the second level of hierarchy of strategic intent and broadly defines why an organization exists. Piers and Robinson have defined mission as the fundamental unique purpose that sets a business apart from other firms of its type and identifies the scope of its operations and product and market terms. Mission supports the strategy formulation in the following ways. It helps in deciding the direction in which the organization proceeds. It helps the organization to clarify its aspirations and those of various stakeholders. It serves as a reference point in dealing with various stakeholders within and outside the organization. It helps in integrating the organization with its relevant environment by taking suitable actions. It helps in integrating the various subsystems of the organization and operations in light of organizational mission. It conveys a clear message about the organization to the outsiders who come in contact with it. They also help to develop positive attitude towards organization if they are well aware about its mission. Any mission statement should have the following criteria. It should be clear both in terms of intentions and words used. It should be feasible to achieve the desired results. It should be precise and it should be distinctive to reveal the contributions to the society. The third component after vision, mission is the objectives. The key component of any strategic statement is to set the long-term objectives of the organization. It's known that strategy is generally a medium for realization of organizational objectives. Objectives stress the state of being where strategy stresses upon the process of reaching there. While fixing the organizational objectives, it is essential that the factors which influence the selection of objectives must be analyzed. Once the objectives and the factors influencing strategic decisions are being determined, it's easy to take the strategic decisions. This leads to defining the company profile, which states the vision, mission, objectives, goals, capabilities, resource availability, management policies, product details, technology adopted, and so on to decide the strategy. Now, coming to the second step in strategy formulation is the environment scanning, which is nothing but internal appraisal and external appraisal. Environment scanning refers to analyzing the internal and external environmental factors to identify the strengths, weakness, opportunities and threats. It 
involves evaluation of the general economic and industrial environment in which the organization operates. This includes a review of the organization's competitive position. It is essential to conduct a qualitative and quantitative review of an organization's existing product line. The purpose of such review is to make sure that the factors important for competitive success in the market can be discovered so that the management can identify their own strengths and weakness as well as their competitors' strength and weakness. There are two components in environmental appraisal, namely micro-environment or internal environmental appraisal and macro-environmental appraisal. So coming to the internal environment, the analysis of internal environment of an organization like its company business policy, nature of customers, workforce, competitors, suppliers, investors, marketing intermediaries, garment departments, etc. serves to pinpoint the strengths and weakness of the organization. It will help to identify the unique skills and resources that give an opportunity for the organization to improve its competences and performance. It results in competitive advantage leading to superior efficiency, superior quality, superior innovation and superior customer responsiveness. Next is macro environment or external environment appraisal. The analysis of external factors namely political, economic, sociocultural, technological, legal and natural factors will help to primarily identify the strategic opportunities and threats in the organization's operating environment. This comprehensive analysis is known as SWOT analysis, which will support in providing a realistic understanding of the organization in relationship to its environment. After identifying its strength and weakness, an organization must keep a track of competitors' moves and actions so as to discover probable opportunities of threats to market or supply sources. After analyzing the environment, the business firm takes steps to identify various strategies suitable for achieving organizational vision, mission, goals and objectives. Now coming to the third step involved in the strategy formulation, it is the formulation of strategic alternatives. In this step, an organization must practically fix the quantitative target values for some of the organizational objectives. The idea behind this is to compare with long-term customers so as to evaluate the contribution that might be made by various product zones or operating departments. In this step, the contributions made by each department or division or product category within an organization is identified and accordingly, strategic planning is done for each subunit. This requires a careful analysis of macroeconomic trends, a critical evaluation of the organization's past performance, present condition and the desired future conditions must be done by the organization. This critical evaluation identifies the degree of gap that persists between the actual reality and the long-term aspirations of the organization. So based on this gap analysis, Long-term strategies effective for achieving strategic intent are developed along with short-term strategies, deciding the budget and resource allocation for the strategy. Now coming to the fourth step involved in strategy formulation, it is the choice of strategy. The best course of action is actually chosen after considering organizational goals, organizational strengths, potential and limitations as well as the external opportunities. Now coming to the final step in strategy formulation, it is the evaluation and selection of strategy. This ultimate step in strategy formulation defined the strategies, gets it evaluated and the best strategy that has a fit between business environment and resources availability are selected for implementation. Therefore, to put it in a nutshell, strategy formulation is a process of deciding the best course of action for accomplishing organizational objectives after performing situation analysis and understanding the internal and external environment. 
coming to the end of this session. Hope you would have got a better understanding of what is meant by strategy formulation, different schools of thought on strategy formulation and the steps involved in strategy formulation. So having enjoyed the session of sharing the knowledge on strategy formulation with you, I look forward to meet you in the next session. Thank you.